Should I get started? <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Richard Fulton, co-chair of the Religious Freedom Committee of the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, otherwise known as CRSJ. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely CRSJ webinar called, Is There Still a Separation of Church and State? This panel is one of many of a series of rapid response webinars. We're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. We also encourage you to visit the CRSJ webpage and take a look at the latest issue of the section's human rights magazine, which is focused on the intersection of religious freedom uh, and LGBTQ, right, LGBTQ rights from diverse perspectives. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. I will be monitoring the Q&A, or rather, uh, others will be doing so as well, and we will do our best to address them time permitting. We will be sharing a recording of this program with everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And please now to hand the gavel to Religious Freedom Committee Vice Chair and Executive Director of Karma, Rama Abdulalim, who will be moderating the session. Rama, please take it away. Thanks, Richard. My name is Rama Abdul Alim, and I'm the Executive Director of Karama, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. I'm so excited to be here with you today because we are going to be talking about not just the two cases that we said in the blur, but we're actually going to be talking about four cases today with this great panel of experts. Before we get to them, I want to make sure that it's clear that these speakers are talking in their individual capacities and not on behalf of any parties in any of litigation or in any parties they previously represented. We plan a lively discussion with our experts, so we will attempt to get to the audience questions if time permits. So I want to get us started right away. So let me, I'm going to let the, the speakers introduce themselves and give you kind of a snapshot of the four cases we're going to be talking about. So let's start with you, Doug. Well, thank you very much, Rama. My name is Doug hallward Dreemeyer, and I am the head of the Supreme Court practice at Ropes and Gray. Um, and I'm happy to talk about the first of our cases, which is the city of Boston versus Shirtliff. Um, I had the great honor of representing the city of Boston in arguing that case before the Supreme Court. Um, I suppose one of the things we'll talk about in our discussion is whether it is actually a religion case or a free speech case. The, the case concerned an application that a religious organization made to fly what they called the Christian flag on a massive uh, flagpole immediately outside of City Hall in Boston. Um, and the city declined that application saying that they didn't think that it was appropriate for the city to be flying a religious flag. I have to say a little bit more about the, the practice of flag raising in Boston. Um, Usually on three massive flagpoles immediately outside of City Hall fly the US flag, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts flag, and the city of Boston flag. But the city had a practice of occasionally lowering the city's flag and raising another in its place. It started to celebrate the ethnic diversity of the city Irish flag on St. Patty's Day, the Chinese flag on its Independence Day, and it expanded to, to include other days that um, the city wanted to celebrate. The city was an, an early supporter of LGBTQ rights and so flew the, the pride flag during Pride Month. Um, they flew a, a special flag on Mother's Day in support of a Mother's Day march against gun violence. Um, there was a flag flown in support of EMT, uh, Emergency Medical Technician Week. Who knew there was? In the empty week, but there is, and, the, and there's a flag. Um, but if that was it, I think there would not have been a case um, because that would be the kind of thing that one would expect a government to do, and that would be seen and understood as government speech. But in Boston's case, the way many of these requests started was with an application, and the application was one that covered not only flag raisings, but also use of 
the plaza outside of City Hall, a traditional public forum where everybody can speak and not just speak the government's message, maybe they speak a message against the government protesting its policies. And um, the tradition and practice had been that all applications to do a flag raising had been approved. There was no evidence of any prior application having been denied. And so the question was, was this an application that private people could use to, to raise a flag of their own choosing uh, in their own voice, so to speak, or was it the city deciding that it wanted to endorse a, a message uh, and, and make its flag pull available for that? The city thought it was the latter. Um, the, the private applicant thought that it was the former, a, a public forum. And that was the way the case went to the Supreme Court. Um, a majority of the court ultimately concluded it was a close question, but that the absence of clear indication of control by, by the city of, of what flags were accepted or criteria for doing that um, meant that it was more like a public forum. And because it was a public forum, Austin acknowledged that it couldn't exclude any particular speech, even speech that the city would find uh, antithetical to its own message. Um, if it was a public forum, and that's what the court held. Um, but as I said before, uh, it has these religious overtones because it was uh, a religious flag, because the city's explanation was they didn't want to be seen as endorsing that. They thought that that might raise a question whether the city was, was embracing religion in violation of the Establishment Clause. Um, and so at least one of the opinions, uh, a concurring opinion by Justice Gorsuch, uh, said he thought it should have been decided much more uh, uh, definitively on establishment clause grounds and laid out some of his views on that that become very relevant in light of other cases that we're going to discuss shortly. Thanks, Doug. Will, let's turn to you and an introduction and talk about Ramirez. Sure. My name is William Hahn. I'm senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, uh, where we represent religious liberty uh, clients from all faith traditions before the Supreme Court and in federal and state courts throughout the country. I'm also a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. The case I get the privilege of talking about is one where Beckett had a very strong role in the ultimate decision of the court. We had submitted an amicus brief and 16 of the brief's 29 argument pages were cited by the Supreme Court in the majority opinion to explain the kind of background tradition that was upheld in this case, Ramirez versus Collier. This case dealt with the right of a condemned person to prayer and audible touch and, um, and prayer over him before execution. But in order to kind of understand the backdrop of this case, it's necessary to kind of understand why this became such an issue at the US Supreme Court. Starting around, uh, you might think that this would not be a controversial issue at all. Uh, for much of our history, uh, the right of the condemned to prayer before an execution, it was well established. It predates the formation of the United States. And this has been a common practice throughout the country, before the country. And the federal government and state governments routinely allow clergy to minister to the condemned in the death chamber, both by praying aloud and by holding their hands. Uh, but in 2019, Alabama had denied a Muslim prisoner uh, the presence and prayer of, of an imam before his execution. And the Texas Department of Criminal Justice then attempted to do the same thing to a Buddhist prisoner just a few weeks later. At that point, the Supreme Court had stepped in in a case called Murphy versus Collier and said that Texas had to permit the prisoner's Buddhist spiritual advisor to, to accompany him to the death chamber. And since then, the court had been protecting Christian prisoners in both Texas and Alabama. But despite those rulings uh, and also clear history, like I mentioned, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice had imposed two new rules. One prevented clergy from praying aloud and the other prevented clergy from touching the inmate. And they said that these long accepted prayers would be disruptive to the execution, despite any evidence that they had or would. Uh, a death row inmate, John Henry Ramirez, had appealed to the Supreme Court seeking both audible prayer and, and clergy touch from his Southern Baptist pastor during his final moments. 
Like I mentioned, Beckett filed an amicus brief along with Stanford law professor Michael McConnell and the Harvard Law School Religious Freedom Clinic. Our brief described a long history of audible clergy prayer and clergy touch, and it explained why Ramirez then had to prevail under his claim, which was brought under the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And on November uh, of, of last year, the case was argued before the court, and then in March, there was an 8-1 decision in Ramirez's favor, where the court ruled allowing clergy to audibly and physically pray with Ramirez. Like I mentioned, they relied heavily on our amicus brief and really discussed how tradition and history can anchor what is sometimes known as strict scrutiny or the compelling interest test, which is the test that not only the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act uses to evaluate uh, religious claims, but also is typically used in many First Amendment cases. And under that historical and traditional anchoring of the compelling interest test, the court said that this that these new rules that Texas had adopted had burdened Ramirez's religious exercise and that Texas's kind of abstract concerns about disrupting the execution just couldn't be justified. Uh, the one dissenter, Justice Thomas, focused principally on the fact that this is a, a context where uh, death row inmates will often uh, file claims before the court that have really a remote chance of success in an effort to simply kind of delay their execution. And he kind of saw this case as an extension of that body of law. But as the court, as I mentioned over the past few years, really began to recognize the religious liberty implications of the right to the comfort of clergy at the time of death as distinct from a kind of concern about the process of execution. Uh, that explains, I think, why there was greater kind of unanimity and attention drawn to this issue. Thank you, Will. Steve, you give us a little background about you and a snapshot of the Kennedy case. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for CRSJ for doing this timely panel. Um, I'm a professor and teach constitutional law, uh, a separate First Amendment survey course at American University, Washington College of Law. Um, I'm co-chair of the Civil Rights and Social Justice Free Speech and Free Press Committee, which often tries to work with the Religious Freedom Committee and um, coordinate efforts. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to talk about the so-called football coach prayer case, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. Uh, Joseph Kennedy, a longtime Marine veteran, became a football coach in Bremerton, Washington at the high school uh, in 2008. Uh, and after a while began a practice of uh, going to the 50-yard line at the conclusion of a game and kneeling down and praying. Um, his view is that this was his own time, <coughs> excuse me, um, that he was doing this for himself. Uh, he wasn't compelling anybody to join him. Um, the factual record, because this went on for a long period of time, uh, the factual record seems to be somewhat murky. There seems to be a lot of evidence that at times uh, members of the team chose to join him in prayer, even members of the visiting team, sometimes parents, sometimes other coaches. Um, but, but he says he never compelled anybody. There was no a requirement that anybody join him. And on occasion, he was by himself and not with other people. Um, all of this came to the attention of the school district in 2015. Um, and the school district warned him that they felt this would violate the establishment clause, that they would appear to be promoting um, his religious exercise. Um, they asked him to stop. There's an exchange of about five pieces of correspondence, but he eventually continues to pray and the school district suspended and then fired him. He filed suit uh, saying that this violated his free speech and free exercise rights. The school district defended on a number of grounds. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court um, and the Supreme Court with four justices saying they were interested in hearing the case, 
<coughs> excuse me, but not actually voting to hear the case, um, denied cert, um, the case proceeded back in the lower courts. Um, the, uh, the case then came back up and, and granting cert was pretty much a foregone conclusion. Um, the, the court ruled six to three in the coach's favor. And um, I, I told a couple of friends I was going to be especially irreverent here and say it might be the only time in my life that I get to note that a conservative Supreme Court justice advocated a threesome. Um, <laughs> justice, justice Gorsuch, in the opinion, basically says you have to take the Establishment Clause, the Free Exercise Clause, and the Free Speech Clause and make them all work together because they're all part of one sentence in the Constitution and shouldn't be seen as separate uh, and, and independent entities. Um, I think it's the first time a justice has ever said that all three of them needed to play nicely together. But what the court, the court ruled several things. The court ruled first that um, um, the, the coaches Kennedy's um, free exercise right was violated because under the applicable standard, the school district's rule or treatment of him was neither neutral nor generally applicable. That's the, the operable language for free exercise rules. Uh, next, the court considered the free speech question. And uh, the court said, first of all, that this was not government speech. The school district had, had suggested that he was doing this on, on school district time and in his capacity as a coach. And the Supreme Court said, no, it was not government speech that he was actually doing this in a brief window in which the game is over. He's allowed to have some free time before his coaching responsibilities resume. Uh, and it's a period when other people are, are sort of doing their own thing and not engaging in official activities. Uh, so then the question becomes, is the school district discriminating uh, against religious speech unfairly? And the court essentially says that, yes, the school district is treating religious speech um, in, in a manner different from other speech. And it can't do that, although it doesn't entirely make clear what the applicable standard is for a public employee in that situation. Um, and, and then finally, the school district argued that if the coach were allowed to continue, the school district might be perceived to be coercing um, students to pray with him. Uh, and the court rejected that argument, and said there was no evidence of the coercion. Um, so six to three in the coach's favor. Uh, a lot to talk about in this opinion. The court overrules the 50-year-old Lemon versus Kurtzman test for establishment clause violations. Um, it, it, uh, Justice Gorsuch takes for granted, he says totally matter-of-factly, that it's perfectly logical that religious speech should have double protection from both the free speech clause and from the free exercise clause. Well, I'm not sure all of us find that perfectly logical, and I hope we'll come back to that question uh, a little bit later. The dissent was by Justice Sotomayor, uh, joined by Breyer and Kagan, and I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you, Steve. Heather, if you can give us some background about you and the Carson case. Yes, hi. Um, it's wonderful to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a senior staff attorney with the ACLU's program on freedom of religion and belief, and I've been litigating and advocating, advocating in the area of church state law and religious freedom for nearly 17 years now, um, 14 years of which I've been with the ACLU. Um, I've had the, um, I don't know if it's a good fortune, but I've had, I've been involved in all four of the cases that we've talked about today in our uh, amicus brief teams. And um, the ACLU has filed briefs in all those cases, and those will be circulated to you all later um, after this webinar with the resources uh, that the ABA is going to provide. Uh, 
as I think will be clear from today's session, we are at a low point when it comes to the separation of church and state, I'm sorry to say. Um, we'll get more into that later. For now, I'm going to briefly introduce the Supreme Court's ruling in Carson v. Macon. Uh, earlier uh, last month was um, when the ruling came down. That case involved Maine's tuition assistance program. The program came about because some rural areas of Maine don't have a um, high school. Uh, they can't afford to um, build a high school or operate a high school or there aren't enough um, students to attend the high school. Yet Maine's constitution guarantees every student the opportunity to receive a free public education. So to, to provide that, um, to satisfy that right, the state has set up a program where students may attend, students from these areas that don't have a high school, may attend a private high school or another public high school in the area and the state will pay the cost. However, consistent with the state's intent to provide a public education, a secular public education, I should say, the state does not permit, or the state didn't permit funding to be used for schools that inculcate religion through their religious practices um, or through their curricula. Um, and the plaintiffs were families who wanted to send their children to schools that did just that. They were religious schools uh, that both, uh, there were two families, uh, both of the schools that they wanted to send their children to integrated religion throughout their entire curricula. The schools teach students to accept Christ as their personal savior, to accept that the Bible is the infallible word of God and to spread Christianity to others. And their self-professed obje self objectives are to teach students to be good Christians, to promote Christian values and to develop Christian leadership. Maine declined to fund this religious uh, indoctrination and the plaintiffs sued arguing that it violates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. And um, as may not be so, any <laughs> surprise to most of you, the court agreed. Uh, to understand the court's reasoning though, I just wanna take a quick step back before Carson was issued. The court had previously held that states giving out grants or educational funding can't prohibit recipients based on their religious status or identity, meaning states can't prohibit churches or religious institutions from receiving funds as part of a new general program merely because they are religious. There have been a couple of cases that have held that. Um, one is called Trinity Lutheran and one is called um, Espinosa v. Montana Department of Revenue, and we can get back to those later. But in those cases, the court didn't explicitly rule on whether states may deny funding where the money is going to be used for religious uses. So you can't say no churches, but can't, the, the court was clear that you can't say no churches, you can't say no religious institutions, but the court hasn't, hadn't said up until Carson whether or not you could, the state could impose a rule that says you, you can receive funds, but you can't put those funds to religious uses. Um, and in fact, in one of the cases, the court explicitly said, we're not going to deal with that right now. But in Carson, that issue was presented more squarely because Maine's restrictions um, are based in large part on the fact that schools um, are, um, are excluded from the program if they inculcate religion as part of their curricular or if they also impose other religious practices. So in the case, uh, the court basically said, um, the same rule applies as is applied in the previous cases. Um, there's no difference between discriminating based on religious status and discriminating based on religious use. And that the, if the state offers private educational aid, it must fund religious educational uses as well. So when I say private educational aid, what I mean is a school voucher program of, or some sort of you know, program like that. Um, and so this has, you know, widespread effects, not only for school funding and educational aid, but the way that the court wrote its decision also could have broader reaching, broad reaching effects beyond educational funding um, to involve other types of state funding programs where um, the funding is much more direct and um, will be used for a variety of other types of religious uh, activities. And we probably will discuss that more later. Uh, Justice Breyer wrote a dissent which Justices Kagan and Sotomayor signed on to, and Justice Sotomayor also separately dissenting, and she put the impact of the court's decision more bluntly. Um, what she said was that today, the court leads us to the place where the separation of church and states becomes a constitutional violation. And what she meant by that is, states have, lo have long had um, an interest in protecting uh, against taxpayer funding of religion. It's an establishment clause interest. Um, it's it's, it's um, an interest that um, has really existed um, for many states since they enacted their state constitution. 
Um, and with, what the court ruled in Carson was that enforcing those interests, satisfying those interests um, will violate the free exercise clause. Uh, and so um, that, you know, is, is, is problematic. And we've seen that theme in other cases that we'll discuss today. Thank you, Heather. All right, so that's the four cases that we are gonna to touch upon on my subsequent questions uh, about, is there still a separation of church and state? So Will, I'm gonna start back with you. It seems to be the least controversial of the four cases because it was an eight one decision. Uh, but why was Ramirez's protection of the free exercise non-controversial as compared to Carson and Kennedy? Well, thank you for that question. I think the reason is that the statute that Ramirez, the case arises under, isn't distorted by the rather unfortunate establishment clause precedent that is informing a lot of these negative views on Carson and Kennedy. Uh, this is only a low point in our history of church state separation, if you regard our history and our tradition of peaceful pluralism as a bad thing. Over the past 50 years, some of the court's religious liberty decisions have tried to say that we can't learn anything from our history, that we can't rely on our traditions. And as a result, we have to kind of chart our own course, meaning the court has to chart its own course and how to understand how the establishment clause relates to the free exercise of religion. This was the thrust of a 1971 case called Lemon versus Kurtzman, which is the key precedent that underlies the school district's arguments in Kennedy. And it's the reason why Maine excluded religious schools from its program in Carson. That precedent is wrong. The court has now said so, but that's not exactly a new thing either. As uh, Kennedy said, the court had long ago abandoned Lemon and instead was trying to, instead of searching for some abstract ideal of neutrality that ends up just removing religion from public life, sort of treating it like smoking as if it's, you know, something you can do if you really want to, but definitely not in public and certainly not around children. Instead, you would view religion as a natural part of human life and human culture. And you would look at how we have historically understood public religious expression, which as the court said when it began adopting a historical test in a case called American Legion involving the Bladensburg Peace Cross in Maryland, they said that tradition is one of respect and tolerance for differing views and an honest endeavor to achieve inclusivity and non-discrimination and a recognition that religion plays an important role in many Americans' lives. And I think that Kennedy and Carson pick right up where that belongs, or where, that, where that left off in American Legion, and it avoids the getting the courts and governments entangled in whether this is a truly neutral approach to regulating religion, whether the state, uh, whether the schools at issue are too religious, and avoids denominational favoritism because not every person, not every religious tradition, and not every religious organization is going to express their faith in the same way. And the Establishment Clause, historically and traditionally understood, leaves the free exercise of religion free to flourish unless you fall into one of the kind of historical and traditional categories of the establishment of religion, which the court didn't back off from. I mean, the point that there's some long tradition of excluding money going to religious schools from neutral benefit programs, the court made clear in the Espinoza case that was mentioned that that tradition, if you want to call it that, is rooted in 19th century Blaine amendments, which were a blatant attempt to exclude Catholic schools from public life. And that's not a tradition that we're going to rely upon because it's a bigoted tradition. So this is the return to our traditions of peaceful pluralism and away from abstract tests that don't have any basis in anything but the philosophical dispositions of who happens to be on the Supreme Court today. Uh, Heather, I think you want to respond to that. Sure, sure. Uh, so a couple of points. Um, you know, the court and Kennedy said it was going to interpret the Establishment Clause by reference to historical um, practices and understandings. And my question is, which historical practices? Whose understandings? The irony of all of this is, um, you know, the, the histor this historic history test isn't actually tied to any benchmarks, unlike the Lemon test, which was tied to the fundamental principle of religious neutrality. 
And so it's really a lot of guesswork. Um, the, but, but the irony of the guesswork is, is there are actually are some areas where we do know what the founders um, wanted or didn't want. And one of those is in religion, comes to religious funding of education. Uh, James Madison, the principal architect of the First Amendment, strenuously opposed um, funding for um, Christian teachers and religious education. And he even opposed it, even though the taxpayers could direct their funds to whichever denomination they preferred or even to um, a, um, a, a secular uh, private uh, educational experience, the James Madison was ardently opposed to that type of uh, system. So we actually know um, what the founders thought about this, and yet the court has ignored that and hasn't referenced that. And we certainly, I think it's fair to conclude that if James Madison, who is the principal architect of the First Amendment, was opposed to funding um, of government taxpayer funding of religious education, he certainly would be opposed to um, state funded schools um, and school employees themselves um, using their state positions to come and impose religion. So, you know, again, I think the historical understandings test is very problematic for a number of, um, of reasons. But even if we take the court at its word that that's what it's going to do, then they should do that. And they should rely on what the founders said about funding of religion. And it's very clear what they thought about that. Uh, Doug, I think you want to say something too, and then I'll, we'll all come back to you. Yeah, I, would, I did want to jump in on this question of the historical uh, test because it, it has become seemingly very, very important to the court's uh, religion clause jurisprudence. Um, and um, in the Kennedy decision, uh, Justice Gorsuch says that that's the, the test. And we know from some of the other really important decisions uh, over the past month that the court has also focused on history uh, with respect to whether or not to recognize a woman's right to, to terminate a pregnancy, for example. Um, and we also know from those uh, decisions that history is often hotly debated uh, and is subject uh, to being cherry-picked, uh, or at least accusations of that being made. Um, and in, in Gorsuch's Kennedy opinion, although he, he points to history being so critical, he, he really doesn't spell out what that means. He cites to uh, uh, the town of Greece uh, case, which involved whether a, a city council could open its uh, sessions with prayer and, and the court had pointed to, to historical practice along those lines to uphold it. But he does slip in, um, a, a, a reference to his concurring opinion in the Boston case. And I referenced this when I started that he had written um, just for, for himself and one other justice, uh, a, a concurring opinion where he lays out what he thinks the history of the establishment clause is and what it prohibits. And it's, it's, it's actually pretty remarkable because it is very, very narrow. He says, first it, uh, the government exerted, these are the things that were, um, were meant to be uh, pre precluded by the Establishment Clause. First, the government exerted control over the doctrine or personnel of the established church. Second, the government ma mandated attendance at the established church and punished people for failing to participate. Third, the government punished dissenting churches and individuals for their religious exercise. Fourth, the government restricted political participation by dissenters. Fifth, the government provided financial support for the established church, often in a way that preferred the established denomination over others. Sixth, the government refused the established church to carry out certain civil functions, often giving the established church a monopoly over specific functions. I don't think any of us would disagree that the Establishment Clause precludes all those things, but I think that it will strike many as quite a surprise that that would all be all that the Establishment Clause precludes, because those are the kinds of things that raise hair on, on the back of our necks. Um, but I think many of us believe that uh, the, the, the clause goes beyond that in terms of preventing the government from really throwing the support of the government behind uh, churches. Uh, Will, do you want to respond to that? 
I would, thank you. Um, I think the past two comments kind of suggest that rather there's a desire to have a test that goes beyond history and tradition and would require some kind of abstract theorizing from the judge about what is considered neutral, which um, uh, Heather had suggested that Lemon was somehow principled in this way. But honestly, I can't think of a First Amendment case that is more heavily criticized and abandoned across the spectrum of justices than the Lemon test. I mean, even you know, Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan, who, who did dissent in Kennedy, acknowledged in American Legion or Justice Breyer and Van Orden versus Perry, an earlier case, that Lemon is, is an unreliable and unpredictable standard and it turns the court into an exterior, in an interior and an exterior decorator. Is this religious display okay? Is this religious advertisement okay? Are we entangling ourselves? Are we being, um, in, are we endorsing religion? A test that justices across the spectrum recognize could really turn the court into this roving commission of just upending longstanding traditional religious expressions across the country of all kinds. And that's really what gets to this, this issue of pluralism. The court makes a point in Carson that respect for diverse religious beliefs is indispensable to life in a free and diverse republic. And if we are going to have what we have on the ground, which is a pluralistic society with a wide range of views on religion, then we can't simply invoke the power of the courts to exclude them in the name of some abstract view of neutrality. We need to try to learn from them. And when the judicial machinery is invoked for purely unsubstantiated theoretical reasons to kick someone out of the public square, we're losing that opportunity to learn from one another. Uh, the idea that the Establishment Clause would protect something beyond what was historically and traditionally recognized, say take coercion, for example, would result in a situation as in Kennedy, where there wasn't a single student who was ever penalized in any way for not participating in Coach Kennedy's prayers. And nevertheless, at the Supreme Court, the district said that students were somehow coerced. I mean, that kind of just unsubstantiated assertion would end up saying that there is something fundamentally wrong about religion and that offense itself, or simply being offended, is a reason to invoke the Establishment Clause. And if offense is going to be enough to exclude religion from public life, then we're not going to have peaceful pluralism. We're going to be using the First Amendment against each other. So Heather, before I go to you, I think that for us, for the non-lawyers who are listening in, we keep on saying lemon test and the lemon case and opinion. Can you talk about what that was and why it was overruled in your response, Heather? Sure. So the lemon test, um, I think as Doug mentioned, or Steve mentioned actually, was um, a, a 50 year old test that was set forth in uh, a Supreme Court case that may be Kurtzman. And the test is really meant to get at, um, it, what it does end, ended up getting at was uh, religious um, where, situations where the government is not acting in a religious way and it's not necessarily coercive. And there's three parts to the test. One is the government can't act with a religious purpose. It can't act to promote religion. That seems to make sense if you want a government that's religiously neutral. The second part was that the government can't act to, um, the government's conduct can't have the effect of advancing religion. And you might've heard of this um, later referred to as a little bit of a spin on it, the endorsement test. They're very similar. You know, The government can't endorse um, religion. And then the third part of it is that the government can't become entangled in religion. Um, so they can't become enmeshed with um, religious institutions and religious beliefs. And the, the and if, if, if the government violates any one of those three tests, it violates the establishment clause under that. In Kennedy, the court, there has been a lot of criticism, it's true, of um, the Lemon test. And I think a large part of that is because many of the justices don't like the fact that it gets at conduct other than the coercive conduct in the situation that um, Doug laid out from Justice Gorsuch's concurrence. But um, in, in Kennedy, the court said, the court basically overruled their lemon and endorsement test. And they actually, the, what, what the court said was, we've already previously abandoned them. They didn't even go through the trouble of the analysis that they would normally go through to overrule precedent. And maybe that's because they're a little bit gun shy after having overruled Roe v. Wade and um, you know, some of their other decisions, this, um, this uh, term, but basically the court hadn't 
previously abandoned lemon, but they declared that they had the test was they clearly, you know, intended to overrule it with this case. And so what that means is that now um, establishment clause violations will be adjudged by um, whether or not or alleged establishment clause violations will be judged by whether or not they're coercive under the court's definition or, um, you know, this uh, in, in, in reference to this historical practices and understandings test. Now, you know, I'm curious what uh, William thinks of some of the cases that have um, been instrumental in the public schools to stopping um, public school promotion of religion. Under the Lemon test, uh, this the Supreme, you know, it's the Supreme Court and other place courts have held that displaying the Ten Commandments in public school classroom is unconstitutional. Teaching creationism, unconstitutional. Um, a number of other types of promotion of religion uh, that um, you know may not be considered coercive by this court, at least, um, have been held unconstitutional both in the school context and in other contexts. And when we eliminate the lemon test, which was not perfect, um, but when we eliminate it, we are um, the court is really constraining uh, our ability to get at these other types of promotion of religion that signal to religious minorities and non-believers that their government um, favors um, the majority faith and disfavors them, that their government puts um, its thumb on the scale in favor of um, certain types of um, religious people and not others. And so, you know, it's a huge loss that the court has overturned Lemon and it's gonna make it a lot harder um, for um, individuals to challenge these types of um, government promotions and endorsements of religion that are damaging. And I don't, and, 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 and the, the point that I was gonna come back to um, earlier um, was just ad addressing what William said. There's this idea that the establishment clause is somehow um, hostile to pluralism, but in fact, the establishment clause is, is part and parcel of um, the religion clauses because it is necessary to pluralism. When the government is putting its thumb on the scale of one religion, when the government is favoring religion over non-religion, that discourages pluralism. Um, it, you know, it, it, it alienates people. It um, creates um, uh, uh, dissent in communities, religious division and divisiveness in communities. So the establishment clause and a robust enforcement of the establishment clause is actually um, vital to protecting religious pluralism in our country. And you'll see that theme through a lot of the Supreme Court's church states decisions over the years, although they seem to have abandoned that theme in the, you know, recently with the recent court. Well, I think you want to respond and then I want to move to Stephen on another related question. Sure, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief because I think it's important to point out where Heather and I agree, which is that the establishment clause is essential to a peaceful pluralism. The Lemon test, however, is not. And the Lemon test is for exactly the reason that was suggested by Heather's comments, which is the idea that school curriculum could be conflated with voluntary personal prayer. We see this over and over again with the Lemon test, where it routinely sanctions viewpoint discrimination against private religious displays, monuments, memorials, advertisements, houses of worship that want access to historic preservation grants. Over and over again, Lemon is invoked to prohibit all of this, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with what the Establishment Clause was adopted to protect against, and, and invoking cases that actually involve legal coercion to go up to say, and that's why in this case where we have totally unsubstantiated claims of psychological coercion, that that's why we need to kick Coach Kennedy off the field and put him in a private prayer box, which is what the, what the school district said was the alternative to, if he wanted to keep his job. That has nothing to do with peaceful pluralism, and it says that there's something wrong about religion. Okay, Steve, I want to move to you. I think the audience may be confused after hearing all of this back and forth. Is the Supreme Court now turning the religious clause issues into free speech questions like the majority did in Kennedy versus authentic free speech issues like in the Boston case? Uh, the short answer is I think yes. Um, I think the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Gorsuch, as I said earlier, uh, and I'll, I'll quote from the opinion, Justice Gorsuch and Kennedy says it's not, there's nothing odd about having dual protection 
for religious expression. He says the free exercise clause protects religious exercises, whether communicative or not. The free speech clause provides overlapping protection for expressive religious activities. So historically, I think the court hasn't really thought that the free speech clause was necessary the relationship for, for this purpose, the relationship was between the, the establishment clause and the free exercise clause. Uh, as with the city of Boston here, as with the Bremerton school district here, they believed that allowing this religious expression would cause them to violate the establishment clause because they would appear to be endorsing the Christian flag on, on City Hall Plaza in Boston, or Joseph Kennedy's prayers at the football game. <laughs> the court seems to be changing this equation so that it's between the free exercise clause and the free speech clause, and the establishment clause has no role to play. I think William probably would celebrate that fact, but um, uh, it does seem to me to be a very significant shift. There are, as Heather suggested, any number of school speech curriculum cases in the past, which might have come out differently if the court was applying a free speech analysis. Uh, in the Louisiana creationism case, uh, the, the, the school district said it was passing a law, or the state said it was passing a law uh, allowing the teaching of creationism with equal time for the teaching of evolution as a matter of academic freedom, because teachers wouldn't believe they had the, the expressive right to teach creationism. And the court, frankly, said that was nonsense, um, that creationism was religion and that Louisiana was just trying to promote the teaching of religion. Uh, that case might come out differently if you apply the free speech clause to it instead of making it an establishment clause issue. What I think the court is doing here, and others have already said this, is, is basically reducing the establishment clause to, to uh, its most minimalist self. The establishment clause over time, like it or not, has represented the image of the separation of church and state. Um, one of my favorite moments in the modern history of religion clause litigation, and I, you all may remember what case it was, I apologize, I don't, uh, but there was a moment where uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist got so upset about the use of the metaphor of the wall of separation of church and state that in a dissenting opinion, he said, why are we relying on that metaphor anyway? That was articulated by Jefferson, and he wasn't even here, he was over in Paris, what did he know? I mean, it was sort of arguing about the metaphor rather than arguing about the actual meaning of the, the religion clauses. Um, the lemon test, I think, also embodied the, the separation of church and state and the attempt to give meaning, uh, significant meaning to the establishment clause and to that notion of separation. I think, as I've said to some friends in the last few weeks, the court is in the process of turning that wall of separation into a speed bump, um, and, and it's succeeding. I think that's been on the, on the agenda of some justices, the, the access cases going back to the early 80s. This is a 40-year project started by Rehnquist and, and being continued now. Um, and I think that's where we are. Back, I'm rambling a little bit back to the speech point. Um, I do think that the, the idea that you need free speech doctrine to protect religious speech when it could already be protected and is being protected by the court under the free exercise clause um, makes me nervous about the court's direction on free speech jurisprudence. I'm not sure that, that, that the court isn't in some mischievous way kind of undermining the, the notion of free speech um, by treating religious speech as simply being subject to content discrimination the way other speech would be rather than treating it through the pre-exercise clause. So I would throw back to Doug, why, why isn't the Boston case 
a free exercise case, as you raised at the very beginning. Um, you know, why is it purely a free speech case? The city of Boston made its decision based on the fact that the organization called it a Christian flag. Um, and yet the term free exercise of religion doesn't appear anywhere in the Supreme Court's opinion. So I'll stop there for the moment. Well, if, ahead, if it's Doug, okay you with you, I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up. And um, mm -hmm. because I think that the answer to your question, Stephen, is that, um, you know, really the issue in the Boston case was whether it was the city of Boston's own speech program in which the city of Boston, everybody agreed that the, at the very least, the city of Boston was free to refrain from communicating a religious message itself. I mean, maybe we can just debate about whether it could have uh, on its own expressed a view uh, that had religious content, but it was certainly free to say, look, we don't want to be in the business of, of communicating a religious uh, message. And so we're not going to do that. When Once the court held that it wasn't Boston's speech because Boston had sort of ceded control, if you will, to the flagpole uh, to, to private persons as long as they applied through the proper means and, and, and abided by its other rules. Then it was the public forum, then it was the private person's speech, and then merely the fact that the private person was speaking on the city's flagpole didn't um, turn it into an establishment clause problem. But I, I see the same issue in terms of like whose speech is it um, coming up in Kennedy. Um, we filed an amicus brief for a number of uh, school administrators in Kennedy talking about the importance of uh, the school districts as employers to be able to control the message of its employees, um, in part because the schools can be held responsible for what those employees say uh, on their time as employees. They could be, the school district could be liable under anti-discrimination laws. Um, and so, um, you know, we think that it's very important that the law be clear as to who the speaker is. And in, in this instance, um, we'll, we'll maybe get into a little bit more later, the, the very stark contrast uh, between the dissent and majority opinions about what the facts were in terms of the nature of the speech and, and, and how the coach was doing this. Because I, I think that that's going to be one of the lasting complications of the cases. How do we apply it to other fact patterns and, and whose version of the facts do we uh, adopt as we apply it to, to the other cases? So, Doug, that goes nicely into my next question. And Will, I'm going to start with you. So, as a member of Minority Faith, I've been inundated with questions that say, hey, if it was somebody, if it was a Muslim out there praying, or if it was a Muslim school, it wouldn't have come out the same way. We think that this is only because it is, you know, a Christian school that this happened. Uh, Will, how do you respond to that? Because people are really trying to wrap their heads around what especially those two cases mean for minority faith groups. Right. Um, <clears throat> I actually think one of the virtues of both Carson and Kennedy in this regard is a desire to avoid what the court said in Carson as denominational favoritism. In other words, one of the problems with the way that Lemon infected the establishment clause is it made presumptions about what religion looks like. And those presumptions were from the heads of the members of the court applying the tests. And they assessed whether you were being neutral to religion based on their own presumptions about what religion looked like. Um, and that's also what happens when you have these more nebulous tests that aren't anchored in history, that aren't anchored in tradition. It gives more room for mischief that would cut against pluralism. And so a virtue, and this is actually one of the points that was made really well on Ramirez, which is that there is this long historical tradition of allowing clergy prayer and, and physical touch of prayer uh, in the death chamber. And it's applied to Buddhists, it's applied to Christians, it's applied to Muslims. 
And that provides a way to avoid us making subjective policy judgments as judges about the right way religious liberty cuts. And you could say the same thing about coercion in the case of Kennedy. If a school teacher were to wear a kirpan or were to bow in the direction of Mecca on the football field, no one would say that simply because someone might be offended by that particular kind of religious speech, it's therefore the school speech or it's somehow not allowed or they need to go and do that in a private prayer box. And yet all of those things were said about Coach Kennedy. And the same thing with Carson. There were a number of questions that came up during the Carson oral argument about how Maine identified sectarian schools. And the standard that they used would create all kinds of inconsistent results depending upon what your religion was, how your church was structured, and also what beliefs you taught in the school. And so if the First Amendment is going to mean anything, it can't create a situation where it's allowing courts and bureaucrats to be second guessing, particularly unfamiliar and unpopular religious beliefs, just in the name of avoiding entanglement, because what it's going to produce is favoritism in favor of the religions that judges know and understand and prejudice against the ones that they don't. Uh, Steve, I think you want to respond. Yeah, I just would make an observation. To me, um, religious pluralism was an era when the court was telling states that their unemployment laws had to protect Seventh-day Adventists, not an era in which the court is ruling in favor of majoritarian religions, which is where we seem to be now. Heather, I think you want to respond, but in responding, can you also talk about what effect Carson and Kennedy have on public schools? Sure. So uh, I want to get to the question of the religious minorities in the public schools, but I do just want to push back a little bit on this idea that this historical test is somehow a neutral, objective standard um, that um, you know, has clear answers and cannot be manipulated by the court. That I think is just not the case. And we've seen that with um, other um, decisions issued in this term, including uh, the Dobbs decision and also the gun control decision. But in terms of the question about religious minorities, I don't wanna, um, you know, sound too doomsday here, but the, the more we erode the separation of church and state, the more religious minorities are at risk. Um, and I've been practicing in this area for 17 years, and it is extraordinarily rare that I get a complaint that the government is promoting the faith of a religious minority. It's almost always one faith, and it's almost always Christianity. And the complaints are coming from non-believers and, um, and people of minority faiths, sometimes from Christians who think that's sort of the co-opting their religion, and they're, they're upset about that. But for the most part, um, the government promotion of religion has been um, by uh, majority faith individuals um, and government employees. And um, so, you know, religious minorities, the, the more we are about the separation of church and state, the less protection there is against that. And religious minorities are going um, to suffer. In the school context, uh, you know, the, the students in the, in the Kennedy case, the players, uh, first of all, note that there was evidence in the record that several of them felt coerced. Um, of course, you would. If your football coach is determining your playing time, if he's talking to um, recruiters about your college scholarships, you're gonna feel, and just the, the nature of the relationship between a coach and a player, you're gonna feel coerced to join into these, to join these prayers. Um, and in fact, that is, is what happened in that case. And in that case, we know that at, the, at least that there are students on the team who are um, not of the majority faith. There are some, were at least some non-believer students, I believe students of other minority faiths, and just putting them to that choice is religiously coercive and it's harmful and it's alienating to a student, a high school student, to have their coach out there on duty, which he admits, um, in the middle of the field praying and feeling this pressure to go join in. So that's gonna be happening, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, despite the court's claim that it was only ruling on particular players and what prayers and whatnot, that's gonna be happening in a lot more. And religious my, uh, minority faith students are going to, I think, unfortunately have a tougher time in public uh, schools. And then in terms of, um, you know, the issue of, you know, how is this gonna affect public schools more broadly? Well, I just think um, it's going to make it harder for them to 
um, enforce the establishment clause because there's going, they're going to be concerned that you know they're going to be faced with a free exercise and free speech uh, lawsuit from their employees. And in the context of funding, um, you know, you can talk about the fact that oh, funding you know will go to um, can go to schools of various faiths, but the the, the on the ground fact is that. Um, school voucher programs to the extent that they provide funding to private schools and to the extent that they provide funding to religious private schools, um, that funding overwhelmingly goes to Christian schools. And there are just not as many options, um, private school options for students of minority faiths. And so even if that funding is available, they're not able to take advantage of it. And what those programs end up doing, those students remain in public school and what those programs end up doing is diverting public funds from public schools. So public schools have less money Private religious schools have more money, and many of the students who um, would make like to attend those private religious schools can't because they, the, the schools are not operating um, based on their faith. And many of the private religious schools that receive those funds discriminate um, in employment and in their admissions against students of minority faiths, against LGBT students. So you know the idea that this is somehow that these um, funding programs and that this court's interpretation of the free exercise clause is somehow um, lifting up pluralism in, in the educational context is just not true uh, in my experience. Thank you. So I want to move because we're quickly running out of time. Shockingly, it's already after three o'clock. Um, there was a question, I think, Heather, you're typing one answer, so I'll let you finish typing that one. I'm going to go to the next question. It was really, I think, for you, Will, um, it was kind of saying just because we've done things uh, in the past doesn't mean that they were right. And it was an example of what we have done in the past is now that was allowable back then and now is malpractice. And they were talking about bleeding people for centuries and now you can't bleed them, a medical malpractice issue. What about that response that, you know, history is not, you know, this great thing that everybody agrees on? Right. That's a great question because it's important to point out that the court's using two different words in that phrase, history and tradition. And so it's not simply looking at the time of the founding or any other particular snapshot in history when assessing what did an establishment clause claim mean or what did a free exercise clause claim mean or what kind of religious exercise was protected. You are looking at how, a cert how certain kinds of practices applied over time and then distilling from how those practices applied over time, a rule. The Bladensburg Peace Cross case that I mentioned called American Legion from 2019 is a really good example of this because it surveyed the role of religious monuments and how that meaning can evolve over time and nevertheless still signify something important to a community. That's a really good example of that. And I'll also say that a good virtue of a history and tradition approach in this way is that it allows for the court to make decisions based on the bottom up as opposed to imposing their own theories from the top down. The court is learning from how ordinary Americans over time in different parts of the country have incorporated our unrivaled religious diversity and our commitment to both non-establishment and free exercise. Learning from our practices is perhaps the ideal way to interpret the Constitution because it has nothing to do with a judge's personal beliefs and everything to do with how we've lived. Okay. Robin, if I, if okay, I, I think, yeah, I just want to jump in on that because I actually will, I, I like very much your description of the court's use of history and I, I hope that's what comes to pass. I'll sort of just by sort of broadening it, we, you know, Heather mentioned the Dobbs decision and its use of history. Um, and I didn't see that type of uh, recognition of the historical evolution of, of traditions that grow out of history. Instead, the court rooted its decision about women's autonomy in a time when women were not fully, you know, recognized as, as legally responsible individuals. Um, and uh, Justice Thomas's concurring opinion there cast the question whether uh, the same approach would be taken to the rights of LGBTQ individuals, whether we would look to a history when they were treated as criminals 
rather than to our, our present circumstance to determine the scope of their rights. And, and when I read Justice Gorsuch concurring opinion in the Boston case, again, it seems to be very, very tied to specific historical uh, practices at the time of the founding and saying that that seems to be what the clause prohibits. I, I like your characterization of it as one that is influenced uh, and takes account of uh, a, 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 a tradition and a growing history informed by even a much greater pluralism that we have in our society today. Uh, I guess it remains to be seen how the court will in fact uh, uh, apply that going forward. Uh, will, you had something to say? And just briefly, um, the Beckett Fund filed a brief in the Dobbs case. We don't take a position on abortion as such, but on this particular issue of the role of tradition, it, it bears some relevance to the religious liberty discussion because the point that we made in our amicus brief there in Dobbs was that you can have a disruption or a rupture that occurs over the course of, of the time in law that ends up distorting other firmly rooted traditions. And the point that we made in Dobbs was that the recognition, the invention of a new constitutional right on a divisive social question like abortion ended up distorting our law's longstanding commitments on free speech and religious liberty. We pointed out a number of cases where the Supreme Court had frankly changed the rules about what content discrimination was, creating a right to be left alone that isn't recognized in any other constitutional context, creating political conflicts with say the Little Sisters of the Poor or other religious entities that would have probably been accommodated under our longstanding consensus of trying to accommodate as many religious beliefs as we can. And it was distorted by taking this, this decision away from the institution that historically had possessed the freedom over it, which was the, 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 the legislatures. So the tradition-based analysis also assesses whether there's been a rupture along the way and the effect that that might have on other well-established traditions in the constitution like religious liberty. Uh, Steve, you have something? I just wanted to pose a history question. Um, I, like Doug, I think, Will, you're stating an, in, an interesting and important vision of the history, but Clarence Thomas says the Establishment Clause shouldn't have been in, incorporated to apply to the states at all. And all it really meant was there should be no federal officially established church. Why isn't that the correct reading of, of history? The Kennedy case cites uh, Michael McConnell's two volume William and Mary Law Review article about establishment and disestablishment at the founding, an opinion that Justice Thomas joined that makes very clear that there were establishment clause principles applied even at the state level at the founding era. But just to be clear, Justice Thomas has repeatedly advanced that view in case after case. And, and um, Justice Gorsuch also signed on to an opinion that Justice Thomas wrote in the uh, Espinosa v. Depart Montana Department of Revenue case saying the same thing. So there's been at least some expression um, beyond Justice Thomas of support for that principle, which would be you know, extremely troubling. That would pretty much, that would reduce the establishment clause to nothing, essentially. So we have a question in the chat. It's pretty long, so I want to kind of summarize it. But basically saying, um, is is more inclined to give religious groups power to indoctrinate all children about the religious view instead of being uh, a secular education? And is that, you know, by really giving more power to religious groups, is that really undermining democracy? Uh, and really not respecting, they want to know if respecting religious diversity can also allow government to require secular education in history, science, civics, like, what are your thoughts on that? And anyone can answer. No one wants to answer. So I, I, I didn't quite understand the first part of the question, but I didn't quite hear what you said. But um, as to like the latter part of the question, 
you know, the, the government doesn't mandate um, that you get a secular education in those subjects. You, uh, you know, parents can send their children to private religious schools um, and pay for it. Uh, and they can, you know, learn um, and be indoctrinated into their faith and, you know, as they wish. Uh, it makes sense for the, in, in my view, it makes sense for the government to mandate that education be secular when we're talking about public education because public schools have to serve students of all faiths and those of none. And they cannot do that um, properly without excluding students, without violating students' religious freedom rights, which I don't want to lose here. I don't want to lose the fact that, um, you know, the players in Kennedy, they have their own religious freedom rights. Um, they have a right to, you know, believe what they want and practice what they want and not have their teachers and coaches impose on them. But in any event, public schools have to serve all of those students. And so, um, it makes sense that their education would be secular and that the state would mandate that so that the state can um, achieve its public education goals, not impose on the religious freedom of students who um, have to attend those schools and um, ensure that um, those, those schools are sort of welcoming and safe and, and conducive to education for all. I see another question in the chat. Uh, it's basically going to the point that in other countries, secularism has gone so far so that, you know, it's even uh, prohibiting public servants from wearing religious symbols of any kind, uh, explicitly employed language, state neutrality. Uh, do you think we're going in that direction here in the United States or are we going in the other direction? I think we're going in the other direction. Um, we're certainly not getting, at least in the eyes of the Supreme Court, we're certainly not getting more secular. I think the Supreme Court is moving strongly in the direction of allowing more recognition of religion in in public life, in the public square, and in, in, in all kinds of ways. So um, I don't see us moving in the, in the way that some of those European countries are. Doug, do you agree with that? I, I, I suspect that you've come up with the one topic on which all four panelists would absolutely <laughs> agree, plus our moderator, that you know that type of individual expression of one's religious belief um, is is fundamental to to who we are as a as a country, as a pluralistic society. Um, and, and I think that at the end of the day, I said this before we get back to the sort of like competing view of the facts of the Kennedy case, because as the majority describes the facts, the coach just wanting to go and kind of pray on his own in a moment where he could have been checking his iPhone and the, and, and the kids were off uh, doing something else. I think we would all agree with that. That would be a non-controversial. And yet the fact is that as the dissent, uh, dissenting opinion shows, um, you know, instead you have a coach standing at midfield holding up the helmets of the, the team surrounded by the players kneeling in front of him as he gives uh, a, a, a prayer. Um, and which of those realities is the one that controls, is, is the next time that a school district is confronted with the picture that the dissent cites going to have to allow that? Or can they say, no, Kennedy didn't decide that because Kennedy was about this private prayer uh, that, that, that the coach said he wanted to do. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure uh, how, what the lasting impact of the decision is gonna be on that. Uh, Will? Sure, just a quick point about Kennedy is that the idea that people were coerced was something that the school district only argued at the Supreme Court. It wasn't the basis that his con that Coach Kennedy's contract wasn't renewed. It wasn't the basis on which the Ninth Circuit issued its decision, the lower court. It was only something that was argued at the Supreme Court. And there's no dispute that even if Coach Kennedy had prayed on the field alone, that, the, court, that the, the school still wouldn't have renewed his contract because he was praying in public. And that's the principal problem for the school district. And that principal problem only comes from Lemon. Uh, Heather? 
Well, just to get back to what Doug was, I'm obviously I, I disagree with William's characterization there, but to get back to what Doug was saying, just the fact that um, Kennedy has created this confusion is troubling because you know schools are I, I, officials are risk averse, and so what you are going to see, I think, is that um, they're going to lean towards seeing that photo and thinking, oh, we even if though the court court, court purported to only be ruling on him praying individually by himself, they're gonna see that photo and they know what happened. We all know what happened. I mean, the facts are laid out as Justice Sotomayor does in her dissent quite capably. And there's the photographic evidence and it's really undeniable, but they're going to look at that and they're going to be deterred from wanting to enforce establishment clause boundaries. And, you know, so the, the, you know, the court can say it was really related on X, Y, and Z. And certainly I think we're going to try to hold the court to that, right? We're going to try to, as we move forward in these cases, you know, point that out. But um, it's, it's on the ground in everyday practice. What it's going to mean is that is that um, school officials are going to shy away from enforcing establishment clause boundaries, um, even if they would, uh, you know, even if their employees' conduct would um, technically be unconstitutional under you know what the Supreme Court claimed, the facts of the Supreme Court claimed in this case. Well, I see we're getting close to time. So I wanted to ask the big question to all of the panelists. Uh, we pulled people in with a catchy title. Is there still a separation between church and state? You know, we got rid of Lemon. You know, all these cases came down. You know, we don't really know what the coercion test covers or doesn't cover. You know, do you feel there's still a separation between church and state? So, Steve, let's start with you. I think it has been eroded quite substantially and will continue to be eroded um, and and um, that there's not a lot left. And I'll just make one quick point, which I hope may, maybe maybe Will will want to respond to and we'll run out of time. I apologize for that. Um, you know, I think there's a fundamental change over the last 60 years that we're not talking about and it goes to this coercion question in the school prayer cases in the early 60s, in the graduation prayer case, um, we didn't have to have mountains of evidence of witnesses lining up and saying, I was coerced, I felt coerced, I felt put upon. It was assumed in those cases that the effect of prayer in a classroom, that the effect of prayer at a graduation ceremony was going to have a significant impact on, on the freedom of people to decline to participate, that they wouldn't feel free. They would feel like the, the freak in the room because they weren't participating. Um, this is, I'm not disagreeing with what Will's characterizing, but I would underscore what a dramatic change it is in the way we think about these cases over the last five or six decades. Um, now, we don't want to assume any coercion. You got to line up the witnesses and make them testify that they felt they had to go to the 50 yard line and pray, um, where it was kind of obvious in the past that that was an impact on people. And, and I think that's an important change. Uh, Doug, your thoughts? I think there still is some separation uh, between church and state, but I think that it uh, largely resides now in the the legislatures and uh, state governments that that want to refrain from uh, adopting religion uh, as part of their own speech or their own programs. Um, and I think that that will work as long as they remain free to do that. The Carson decision of all of these is probably the most uh, worrisome to me because it's the one in which the court says to the state, no, you cannot uh, re refrain from having a religious school be part of your uh, offering of education to the children of Maine. And um, uh, I, I think that as the court ventures into this area of mandating that states in include religion, uh, within their their public programs, um, that that will have ultimately the the, the greatest impact on a, on eliminating that uh, that prior wall. Um, Heather, 
Well, I agree with a lot of what um, Steve and Doug have said. Um, there, I mean, the separation of church and state still does exist, but it has been significantly eroded. Uh, I think that states are going to find it hard to provide extra protection because the Supreme Court, where we are right now, we didn't get to um, the issue of the play in the joints, but where we are now is basically the Supreme Court is moving towards uh, a framework, constitutional, constitutional framework in which in many circumstances, enforcing the establishment clause is a violation of either the free speech clause or the free exercise clause. And, you know, that is very troublesome and, um, you know, we'll continue to push back against that, but um, the, 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 the direction that the case law is going and that the Supreme Court has made clear it wants to go is um, a direction that is basically going to turn the establishment clause into a historical fit, a footnote. And I think that that's where we're going to move very quickly in the next few years. Will? I think the separation of church and state exists as exactly that, a separation of church and state, which is not to be confused with a separation of religion from public life. And I think that's the distinction that the court draws in all of these cases. Uh, and Carson, I actually think is a great example of that because it's, it's safeguarding uh, a protection of, for, from government bureaucrats assessing how religious you are based upon their own biases before you get to access the public square. Kennedy's another example of we're gonna apply a rule that only applies to religious speech, but wouldn't apply to other like motivational speeches, for example. And we're gonna assess whether your speech is too religious uh, for prime time. Uh, that, that's, that is entanglement. That's denominational favoritism. And that's no longer allowed in the name of an, of an establishment clause that was designed to prohibit those things. So in some ways, the separation of church and state is more firmly established because it's no longer conflated with the separation of religion from public life. Well, thank you all for joining us for this free webinar today. We'd like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists. You are all doing such critical work and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your experiences and your knowledge. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you in your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. You may do so at AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ. Best of luck in your work and stay 